it really is a delusion that we're in control of anything. Do you control your wife, Tim, and every opinion she has and action? You've had kids, right? Did you control every one of their choices and behaviors? Do you control your health? Do you control your ultimate income, the end of your life? When's that? Come? No, we don't really control anything. God does. But we live in this sort of false narrative that we are. And that, see, for me, that traces all the way back to the beginning when what was the first sin? They said, what well, we can manage the knowledge of good and evil and right and wrong for ourselves. And we'll create an identity apart from God. Welcome to Seek, Go, Create. This is where we challenge conventional definitions of success, explore stories of transformation in leadership, business, and ministry. We're going to be talking to Caesar Kalinowski, a dedicated father, church planner, coach, and best-selling author. He's impacted thousands of lives all over the world, equipping individuals in discipleship and mission. Caesar, welcome to Seek, Go, Create. Hey, Tim, good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Right. been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I think you're the first guy. You know what? No, you're not. You're not the first guy we've had named Caesar. I had a guy that was spelled differently. That's like a strong name. If you've got a this name is, like Caesar, you're strong. Yeah, this is the strong. classical spelling. It's like the pizza, the salad, the emperor. You know what? It's a family name. I'm the third Caesar. My son's the fourth. My grandson, Caesar V, heir to the throne. And it turns out, I didn't know this most of my life. I had an old buck guy, a historian in Poland tell me, oh, because I said, how do these two names go together? He says, Kalinowski, that's, it's a royal name in, in Poland. And then I had Googled. I knew that somewhere back in history, we were <laughs> royalty, whatever that means. And, uh, and he goes, Kaiser, it's ruler, Kaiser Kalinowski, very regal name, very royal name, family name. I'm like, oh yeah, it's family name for us. And he goes, there you go. That's how it works. There's a lot of Caesars floating around three living right now. That's my life goal now, Tim, is to get to the point where we have a photo with four living Caesars. It's never happened yet. So I'm <laughs> hoping. We don't have as cool of a name in our family, but we had Kelly was a middle name that my family my grandfather had, my father had, I had, and then my son had. So it was a bunch of Timothy Kelly, Joshua Kelly, Garland Kelly, all that. And so that was cool. But real quick, I'm getting off my first question. I'll get to in just a moment, but what are the pros and cons of having a name like Caesar? Because my first thought is world ruler, strong leader, possibly. That's me, bro. That's you, man. Cool. It's interesting because I, I, I used, before there was all video and everybody knows what you look like and all this, or hear you, they would say, I just assumed by your name, you were this little short guy chomping on a cigar. And I used to hear that all the time. It was the weird little combination of stuff. It is definitely a strong name. It luckily Kalinowski's phonetic. So people can mostly figure out how to pronounce it mostly, <laughs> but uh, I, it's hard to know what the negatives are. To be honest with you, I think it sounds, it ha has to sound very European and I'm going to come on with a thick Slavic accent and you're going to bury on this. And, but when you grow up and it's generational, it sounds like the most normal thing in the world, right? Now, what's interesting is since the invention of Google and the internet and us old bucks can kind of remember when this stuff all started, you know, what, because I am an author and a speaker and got zillions of videos and all that stuff, you can Google my name and a lot of stuff comes up. But now my son, who's an attorney and he's come quite, I had a First Amendment warrior nationally and well-known and quoted and all. Now he's coming up a lot. And I think he's going to, he's going <laughs> to, he's younger, right? So he's going to exceed that. So it's fun. I don't know if the goods are the bads, but I, we've all been strong-willed males. I'll tell you that, you know. I think <laughs> What's you have to own it. And I think there is some degree of it's decreed what your name is. I think names are important. I'm in the middle of reading in the Old Testament and they have real meaning when you go yeah. through it. So I, it does conjure up with me. I must admit, I'm sitting here doing my research. I'm studying and I'm going, Caesar, strong. Listen. Here was my father's consternation. He had me have a military haircut until I was old enough to rebel against that. And, and then part of what this was, is I looked up, I said, do you know what the name Caesar means, which is your name and you gave me, it means ruler with long hair. I'm growing my hair. Dig it. Don't dig it. And I was playing in a rock band back then. So I was like, I can't have this haircut. Yeah. Yeah, now I'm guess, back to it, of course. You know. And I guess you just stay away from the Ides of March, right? You don't get Try bogged to. down. With it's not my favorite holiday. Yeah, Not a good day. <laughs> hey, Caesar, we bump into each other like we have here. 
And I just ask you, or I want to know more icebreaker question. I ask you what you do. What do you tell people when people ask what you do? Depends. Are you asking as a Christian podcaster? Or are you asking as a neighbor I just met? Because I yeah. probably have a slightly different response. Tell me what they are. That's cool, though. I'll tell you how I most often answer people. I just go, I'm an author and a speaker. And uh, my wife and I do some coaching as well based on the things we write and I speak on. And if it stops there, people are like, oh, wow, an author, how's that school? And they get into the technical side. Oh, how'd you get the right books? Not whatever. And it's kind of a need to know basis. And if they go, oh, what do you write about? Then I go, I write about spirituality and faith lived out in everyday life. And they go, what kind of spirituality and faith? They say, well, Christianity, but not so much about the formalized evangelical complex per se, but what if we really believe all this and what's it look like to live it out, not only just on our Sunday experience, but all throughout the week and make that real for us and our family, friends and all. And everybody's always, that's so cool. So that's what I do. And, and, but if someone else asks and they're Christian, I go, I write books about the gospel and discipleship in all of life. And I'm a coach and I get to travel all over the world and talk about these things. Yeah. What's interesting, I love how you distinguish between the two, because I do think it depends on the setting. If you're around a bunch of business people, you might just casually mention something and then see if there's additional dialogue. I do similar. But if you're yeah. in more of a church setting, one of the things that I think you, you say that people love when you bring up, you know, everyday disciples and how to live out your faith every day. But I, I'm not so convinced that everyone is excited about that. I think that there's a group of people that they want to keep people boxed in to the Sunday, maybe a Wednesday. So to, to me, there's a bit of a contrast between everyday disciple and I'll call it the religious or church world out there. Am I reading something? Have you ever seen that? I bet you have. <laughs> Well, let me just so I can answer accurately, Tim, who do you think is the, pe who are you putting in the wants to keep people in the Sunday box? Who do you think's that? Like the say, system, the complex? Yeah, yeah, let's call it the man or the system, okay. the okay. complex, the religious system. I call it church world at times, yeah. and it probably has a little bit of a cynicism tone to it. I, I find it very rare that anybody is going to speak from within the system, you know? against, hey, living out your faith in everyday life. That's what they say. You drive out the church building and it says you're entering your mission field, right? Those signs, you know, all this stuff. No one's really speaking against it. However, I, have, I run into this pretty much every single day, is when you get to the thing behind the thing and they start to read our stuff or listen to the podcast, they pretty quickly see that we're fine, love Sunday, and let's get together, let's gather, let's worship, all that. But they realize that we go, but the six days and 22 hours that are left over, that, that outbalances that two hours of sitting in rows in silence. How do we live this out every day? And then they go, yeah, that's what we got to get our people to do. And I said, pastor or elder or whatever, that starts with you and your family living with an open home, having people in, learning a gospel fluency where you can speak the good news to all of life, not just people's afterlife upgrade and all that. And then that's when, it, that's when the conversation goes, pivot often. And I don't mean it to be polemic, but I've learned that it is inherently polemic because it begins to be compared and contrasted. What's wrong with the way we're doing it? It's nothing, but if that's it, I'm certain, 100% as an old brother, that Jesus didn't come and die so we could sit in rows in silence for an hour or two a week. I'm certain it was meant to be more than that, <laughs> just having read the whole book. And then I don't want to give away the story, but I have read all the way to the end of the book and we win. Like it's all getting restored. You know, this is how it's going to be. And we get to be a part of that whole thing. Now, Jesus said on earth as it is in heaven, ask dad for that. We're gonna. And what we found is when you live this way and you live expectantly, hey, maybe what Jesus said and lived is real and we can do it now. You get to, turns out we get to. And I and no eye has seen and no but and we've not conceived. How awesome is when it's all consummated and heaven happens fully? But it's I think life's pretty awesome now in light of what Christ has done for us and now having his spirit and being the family of God. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. What's your progression been? Because you in your in in your information, you've got church planner, and I believe some of your history is we'll call it being a part of that traditional. Yeah. system and what you just brought up. And I agree that there's 
probably or can be some uncomfortableness with people in that traditional system with what you're doing, what I what we're doing here too. And I went to Bible school for a few years. I've been around churches. I love what goes on in church. What I don't like is when sometimes people begin building their kingdom instead of God's kingdom. And we see that quite often. But what's been your progression? How have you ended up to this place you are now where you're helping people in a daily walk, which does sound a lot like the first century church, by the way, just, yeah, well, I that, just want to observe that. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to super compress the beginning of the story and I'll take a little more time in the, maybe the parts that are more relevant today. So I was, I've been going to church since I was like a zygote, like in my mother's womb. Okay. And that's what we used to call it, going to church. And no one taught that our identity is you either are the church or you're not, but we went to this building that we called the church and did church. And so I did that my whole life around 18. The whole lifestyle of sex, drugs, and rock and roll kicked in pretty good, moved out of the house. And I was like, and done with that too. So I didn't go to church anymore for a little while. God super got a hold of my heart, my life through an actual message on gospel and kingdom. When I was about 25, my wife and I, uh, on the same night at a Christian retreat that I don't even know why I agreed to go to, heard a message about lordship and kingdom and God transformed us. And we got back to our hotel room at this retreat that I still didn't know I was there. And I said to my wife, I said, I got to tell you something. She goes, no, I need to tell you something. And I said, no, me first. And I told her, I said, listen, Jesus is Lord. I want him to be Lord. I want to be Lord of our family, our marriage. I don't know. I'm ruining us. I don't know what we're doing. And she goes, me too. That's what happened tonight. So on that same night, we had this grace upon us. And from that night to today, it's been a straight line of we're in. It was never we never got real lukewarmy. It was like, we're in, sign us up for everything. Now jump way ahead. We're, my wife and I are serial entrepreneurs. We've owned and operated many businesses, dozens actually. And at 40, running a very successful publishing business, I got the call to the pastorate. God almost audibly said, hey, you're going to be a pastor now. And I was like, okay, you're God. So I say yes, but I'm not one. So how's that going to happen? Now, me, so I said yes, and he worked out some just miraculous things with my, my business partners and all and how it worked out. And all of a sudden, I was extricated from a lot of responsibility, and I had a huge severance package, and I was free. But I wasn't a pastor yet, but God was still working on this. It took a whole 90 days before I was actually hired on at the mega church as a pastor. It was weird, right? But along the way, and this is where I'll slow it down a little bit, along the way, I had been doing quite a lot of international missions travel. Not this is going to sound derogatory. Not the weekend warrior missions trip where you go and you stack bricks on a building and help out for a few days, and then you do some beach, and then you hand out some tracks in the city square and you head home. It was like God was taking us to like war zones and where there was Christian persecution happening horribly and natural disasters. And whenever it was crazy, and whenever we were there, a couple things. One was God had me read the Book of Acts. It was always like, "Hey, your trip time with me, read the Book of Acts." And after a while, that just became the pattern over the years, because I did a lot of this. Every time I was on the road internationally, I started reading the book of Acts over and over. God's pretty awesome. What was happening is like when we were with the church in Sudan or Burma in the bush or whatever, the church had nothing, Tim, no things, like the word nothing, no things, like almost no clothing in many cases, homes, psh, no, food, optional. And yet the church, the people, because they didn't have buildings or any of that, were so beautiful and so full of joy, even as they told us stories of great persecution and crazy stuff they were enduring. And I remember like thinking, wow, like for the last several weeks, we've been in the bush being the church. And then by the miracle of flight, I'd fly home. And like within 24 hours, 48 hours, I'm driving up the dr giant driveway to the mega ranch, right? Guys are with the vests and the orange cones and they're parking us. And I'm getting sent to the overflow lot. And I'm like, hey, put the window down. You see who this is? I'm not parking back there. I'm, I'm, come on, you saw me up there. And it was like this evil heart. And it was like, now I'm back and I'm head of production. So it's like headsets, huge team, lights, camera, action, Tim, camera three. You're a little slow on camera three. You got to tip that up a little sooner. We need a little more smoke on the left side of the stage. Literally, literally, bro, all that stuff. And the contrast of what I had just come from and now what I was experiencing, it got bigger and wider and thicker and deeper trip after trip. And this all started before I was even on staff at the mega ranch. 
And uh, eventually this question started to arise. And I know other Christians have had this question. If you've done short-term missions, you're like, man, this was crazy. We didn't know these people. We didn't like the smells. The food was weird. But man, what an experience. And we pulled together and we saw God do some crazy stuff and in us. And you come back and you go, wouldn't it be crazy if we just lived that way all the time? Wouldn't it be just amazing? And then we just, God said, well, then do. You know, like I said, Lord, I would give everything I have to have the joy they have in you. And he goes, then do. And so long story short, that, that mega church, my wife and I were both on staff there. So were some other friends of ours. And we ended up moving out to Tacoma, Washington to live like missionaries in another country called Tacoma. And said, what if we live that way? I don't know. What do you do when you move to another country? If you're going there to plant the gospel and see what God does with it and transforms community. We just started to get to know people. We lived with an open home, which we already did. We got to know everybody's names. We worked locally. We were in cafes all the time. I got known as the pub pastor because I just hung out in my locals all the time. And people would figure out who you were. And then, listen, pastor, I need to talk to you about something. All right, let's go. You're buying. And we started to make disciples that were making disciples. And when people come to faith that way in community, that way, very different than Worst day of my life, I raised my hand. I said to Jesus in my heart prayer about my afterlife, and I'm hoping to God my wife will take me back kind of thing. God cares about all that. I'm not, dis, I'm not belittling that. But when a person walks in the ways of Jesus in community over months and years with you and comes to trust Jesus in more and more areas of their life, that it's a very different type of Christian. And they're like, man, I got to get my sister into this. And my mom wants to hang out. Is that cool? I'm like, of course it is. We're a family. And so... That, that's how that whole sort of transition happened. And so we're not anti and the way anybody wants to gather it up and all that. But if the ways we gather and program and fund get in the way of the only mission Jesus gave us as the church, as his family, go and make disciples, then I think we get to question some of that. I want to come back to this disciple, but I want to, that unique perspective is so cool, Caesar, because some people never experience that. They walk in the doors of their church, small, big, mega, whatever, and they go there every week and they never go anywhere else. My wife and I have traveled quite a bit. And so we visited churches in a lot of places. We've seen some of the things you're talking about. We weren't necessarily on missions trips, but I think it's interesting to see different contrasts in just the way people do what we'll call more traditional church. And you brought up the word joy. And so I want to dig a little bit on that word. You brought up what many people possibly listening to this that are probably first world, probably United States. We've got people in other parts of the world, but a lot of United States listeners, they probably are sitting in a place with it. They're not in an RV like me, <laughs> but they've got probably multiple TV screens. They've probably got multiple vehicles. And they probably have some degree of stress or lack of joy in their life. And they may be going to some of those churches you talk about, but yet you went to those places where people probably had none of the things I just brought up, but yet they Certainly. are allowed to gather and worship the Lord. I don't want to say it's pure, but maybe that's a word. What's up? Why do we lack so much joy? when all of a sudden we have all of these things that, that distract us, all these other treasures. Yeah. Maybe there's your answer in that. I said, Hey, there's times when I don't have joy in my life. There's times when I'm not feeling blessed, even though I'm immensely blessed, or I get myopically worried about first world problems and things that really are adventures and missing the point. I'm not sovereign. I don't get to control that stuff. What I've learned though, is that I can almost always pretty quickly now draw a line back to what's the thing behind the thing. And it's, I'm not believing who God is and what he has said is now true of us because of Christ, our identity, our authority, our privilege. And I'm, tr I'm living basically in a delusional that I'm controlling this or I'm, I'm in charge of this. It really is a delusion that we're in control of anything. Do you control your wife, Tim, and every opinion she has and action? You've had kids, right? Th did you control every one of their choices and behaviors? Do you control your health? Do you control your ultimate income, the end of your life? When's that? No, we don't really control anything. God does. But we live in this sort of false narrative that we are 
And that, see, for me, that traces all the way back to the beginning when what was the first sin? They said, well, we can manage the knowledge of good and evil and right and wrong for ourselves. And we'll create an identity apart from God. Watch this. That's the same thing that's going on in my heart often. And I think when the church dropped the gospel narrative for the afterlife upgrade gospel, when they dropped the narrative of discipleship, which is moving from unbelief to belief in every area of the gospel, moving from lies to truth about who God is, what he's done in Christ and what's now true of us and how we get to live. When we lost that for a, we got to get everybody to say a prayer about their afterlife and Christianity became about sin management and behavioral modification. Now we're left with the law. We're left with, okay, I guess my ticket's been punched, but my job now is to try to sin less between now and Jesus comes back. Is that really what this is about? Let me talk to my neighbors and see if that sounds like good news. Nope, not to them. So I won't talk to them about that. And so now if I'm living under that same tyranny and I'm not living out of my true identity, then I'm still left with, back to the original sin, managing the knowledge of good and evil and building an identity for myself. And you know what ticks me off, Tim, is when you don't salute my identity. When I'm doing my best to put the glory up there for your brother and you're like, no, nope, not digging it. And I go, that Tim guy, you know what I mean? Or when my wife is not going along with my sovereignty in the house or my now adult kids go, I don't know, dad, I don't think so. I think that's wrong. I don't think that's the way we want to be doing that. Then you know, I get consternation over that and I get all chipped out about it. What's going on? I am not believing what's true about God and what's really true about myself. And I think that's the thing behind the thing of where all of our lack of joy or stress or all this stuff comes from. And like I said, I still experience it all the time, but it comes from unbelief. Romans says this, it says that all sin comes from unbelief. Sin's not the action. Hey, I hollered at Tina today, my, my wife or whatever. I was really rude to her. The act, that's not the sin. The sin is the unbelief behind it of who God is, who he's made her to be, who he's made me to be. And I, am I living in light of that? See, the most natural way we can live, Tim, is to live out of our true identity. Think about that. This well, is but, who I am. I get to be. I don't prop that up. I didn't create it. I don't sustain it. I'm completely loved in just who I am. Do to be, that do to be distortion of what you do equals who you are and your value. That's not true. That's a lie. That's called the beast in scripture. When we start to move beyond that, then there's real joy and freedom. And I think, tie it all the way back, when we were with the church, in a war zone or whether it's great Christian persecution and they, there's no do to be. In fact, if they do, they will be persecuted. They're, they're being, they're saying, yeah, my, my brother was chopped to death and thrown in a fire in front of me by Muslim militants because we're Christians and they still have great joy in their life. I'm so grateful to God though. He spared me and he's providing. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. Right? I think what it's going on there is they believe who God is. He's their only hope. They get that. And from that comes that peace that passes understanding. You're like, I'd be ticked off if I had to live in a mud hut and half my family was killed because of our faith. And they're yeah. also, I love the fact that you've mentioned identity twice, because I, I think that there's a bit of a crisis in identity in the world because people are questioning it. There are a lot of people that claim to be Christians and followers of Christ that I'm not sure if they grasp their identity. And one of the things we see with conflicts is people aren't comfortable with their identity. So mm. it's difficult to accept others' identity. And so instead of, I think you said salute was the word you use, I think people are wanting and demanding that you not just accept who I am, but I want you to celebrate me. I oh, yeah, even if to, it's completely a false narrative, I, if I'm going to whiff, Tim, that you're not on the same page with me and ready to celebrate this distortion, bye, can't handle yeah. it, can't handle it. <laughs> and it causes so much conflict. I want, there's one thing that I want to address, and I'll, I'm going to ask it somewhat generic, and I'll let you be as specific as you desire to be. There are the mega churches in our society today get a lot of flack. And I think some of it's well-deserved too, by the way. But I know 
the one you attended, I'll let you share if you want to. I know that at one point it was one of the fastest growing, biggest around. And later they ran into some challenges because of some leadership. What are some of the pros and cons to that structure? I'm a business structure guy. I'm an engineer. And I am coming to where I really love the small group, non all the time, full-time ministry. And so I want to be careful here. I don't want to get into throwing a bunch of stuff around, but I would like just because your perspective to share whatever you're comfortable with about just observations and things we're seeing with that big church structure. It's interesting. We're seeing that kind of dismantle itself in recent years, uh, largely from top down, right? Sort of the cult of personality is crumbling. That's not working as well as it maybe once did. Now, of course, where it's still working, they're like 100%. This, there's a bit of a bubble that, that folks live in. I think we, maybe we all do. See, I have... People assume because we talk about living out our faith in everyday life, which is going to mean in smaller communities, primarily, even if as we regather those or however we regather those, they assume we're anti that. And of course we're not. I believe in the gathering of the saints. I believe in the sharing of all the giftings at the maturest level that God will grace us with gathering up together and all that stuff's a benefit, a blessing to us. It's grace. However, the command is go and make disciples. The command is not get loads of people in a building to sing about me. It just, it's not, it, I, I know. And have smoke and have smoke machines. You brought it up earlier. It's like, yeah, or whatever, or we don't do that. We just have the Barnwood wall now that all the mediums to small churches all like mandatory got three to five years ago. I don't know what happened. Oh, but they all have it. It's crazy. And, uh, and, and we're doing the songs that come from one of four organizations, largely just saw a report on this crazy, right? which people ask me all the time, do you know this song? I'm like, no, nope, because I don't listen to any of it. I think that when all of a sudden our focus there again got off of make disciples who make disciples, you, the benefit gets lost of, wait a minute, just getting 300 people or 500 people or 20,000 people in a room together, that's not discipleship. It might be worship. It might not be. A preaching of the word, if it's the gospel and it's not due to be, if it's not, now you got, here's how you have to go live like Jesus. So go muster that up. That's law. That's not the gospel. There's no should in the gospel or shouldn't. There's you get to, right? Or you need not because Christ already took care of all that. I think the negative of that is if that's the focus, how do you make disciples when you're sitting in rows and rows? So let me give you an analogy. By God's grace, and it really is, my wife and I were both raised in broken homes by wolves. And the only thing we knew when we got married is we don't know nothing about being married and raising kids. But our kids, we have three, boy, girl, told you about Caesar already. They're all adults now and having families and raising kids. And they all still love God and they love people and they love their mom and dad. And we're all like best friends. It's nuts. Like the dream can be real. Okay. And people ask us all the time, how did you and Tina raise such great kids. They really are. And they really, they're fun. If you came over and hung out tonight, you'd feel like part of Team K, part of the family. They would treat you all like family. That's how we roll. And you'd go, man, this is a fun play, bunch to hang with. So people ask all the time, what if Tina said, this is crazy. All we did was, this is how we raised our kids. Once a week on the weekend, usually Sunday morning, we lined up a bunch of chairs in rows in the living room. And uh, Tina says, me and the kids, we sat there in those rows. And largely in silence, we sang a couple camp songs so that they're not that great. We sing them. And then Caesar had this little stand thing. He'd stand up in front of the living room and he would talk to us about the Bible for about 30, 45 minutes. He liked to go long though. And, uh, and then we'd say, see you next week, kids. And, and they're like, I'm doing so. Oh, well, maybe the next week, right? You coming Wednesday? No, that's okay. You guys have a great week, man. We love y'all. And then, and we would do that. And it wasn't even every Sunday because people are busy, but it was most Sundays. And that's all we did. And they turned out amazing. It, now, it's such a goofy analogy that it really hammers that nail, doesn't it? Because you could never raise kids that way, that are effective adults and love each other and love God and people and give their lives of service and, and they're generous and all that. You couldn't do that in an hour and a half a week sitting in rows in silence. And yet somehow we think we're going to form spiritually mature people who are generous and love God and love each other and love people and live like a close family doing that. 
the advantages of living in smaller community is the primary organizing structure. Hey, this is where life and ministry and discipleship happens. And we get to come together and blow it up, man. If you like that sort of thing, go for it, smoke it out. But the benefit of living the way that we see in scripture, but the only way we see in scripture is you get to live as a family. That word oikos, the church in Corinth, wherever it was always oikos, which means extended family. And this is what we talk about on our Everyday Disciple podcast and in all of our coaching exclusively is if, as you live this kingdom life, as you live in light of the truth of who God is and what he says is true of us now because of Christ, and you let the rings of your relationship of your family life and the kingdom move out to include more and more of others and treat them as family, it's amazing what ha- that's your oikos. That's amazing what happens. So for us, that's neighbors, that's our kids, that's a bunch of our kids' friends. It's our friends who are friends with our kids. It's people that are employees. It's someone we met at the cafe that we go to a million times. It's the guy who tends bar at the pub, our local. That's our oikos. And we open up our home and our life completely to those people. We don't hide our faith. They're super interested in wondering about it. Those who show up and hang out, people of peace. There's a real advantage to raising a family that way. And just like God doesn't give us litters, usually we don't have, here's a dozen kids or here's 20,000 kids that try to raise. You get them one at a time, <laughs> you know what I mean? They come in or two or three at a time max, kind of usually. You can't disciple in every area of life. You can't disciple people, mass sitting in rows in silence, just giving them information. Or Jesus would have done it that way. I'm convinced yeah. of it. I know? think it's a challenge. I do think that maybe... We struggle. We know we people can quote the scriptures where to make disciples and and that is one of our commandments. I think I'm really wondering if some of us, I'll go ahead and throw me in here. And so I'll I'm gonna let you define this for us. Some of us don't understand what the word disciple means. Obviously, it's got a word of discipleship. Dis- discipleship, yeah. discipline, things like that. So maybe before we go any further. Caesar, why don't we, let's talk a bit about what that really means, because it is thrown around quite a bit. I went to Bible school for a few years, had a similar experience where there was someone talking at me most of the time, and I was taking notes and studying and doing the things you should be doing. But they would say that your role here is to be discipled. And I actually think that maybe we don't really grasp what disciple means. So talk to us, define it, give all that you can so that we can try to understand what discipleship and disciple means. We've had to try to break this down. Tim, it's a great question. We've had to try to break it down so that it wasn't there again, where we're chasing two different things, but using the same word. And for us, the, what we say, here's our definition of a discipleship. And then I will talk about what's, and then what's a disciple. Discipleship, we believe, ultimately, is this process of moving from unbelief to belief in light of the gospel in absolutely every area of life, okay? Moving from lies to truth, unbelief to belief in light of the gospel. Who is God? What's he like? What's he done in and through his son, Jesus? What's he now say is true of us, our identity, our authority, our privilege because of that? Out of that flows, okay, then how do we get to live? Not should or supposed to, because it's already been done at the cross, it's finished, but how do we get to live in light of that? And so if discipleship is the process of moving from unbelief to belief, helping each other do that in every area of life, then guess what? We're going to have to do every area of life together. It's not a process of disseminating information. It, it's not just deep Bible literacy. We say it's not Bible literacy that we're after, or that Jesus was after. It's gospel fluency. I don't want to freak anybody out. Any of your listeners, maybe they're going to tune out right after I say this. Jesus never owned a Bible. Jesus never discipled Christians. There weren't any. He didn't. He had the 12 knuckleheads that he didn't even choose. Dad chose. It says there at the Ascension that the 11 who were still alive, it said some still did not believe. What? Yeah. Yeah. That's how it goes. That's how this And we think that only one of them was a knucklehead, (laughs) but they all had issues, right? How many of them do we hear about after 
Yeah, just a few. And we just assume they're all out crushing it, planting huge worship services. They got the best sound systems, by the way, all, all that stuff. No, I don't think so. We know some of them went back to like fishing or farming, or I'll go back and see if I can get my government job collecting tax. We, you know, we don't, right? Well, not Matthew, but you know, so we have such this distorted, somewhere along the line, disciples there again, when we lost the gospel narrative of it's not about getting saved and your afterlife upgrade. It's about make disciples who make disciples, which is how we fill the world with God's glory, by the way, as we become more and more like Christ, the mystery revealed. Paul says, God's going to do this through humans. <gasps> what? Yeah. He's going to sanctify them, put his own spirit in them. And as they make more disciples of Jesus, who is the glory of God, the whole world will be filled with his glory. What? That's what's really going on. When we lost that narrative for we got to get people saved, and then Christianity is about sin management and behavioral modification, then, quote, discipleship became about teach them the Bible and get them to do it. Said, yeah, but didn't Jesus say, no, make disciples, immersing them in their identity in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and teach them to obey all that I've commanded. Didn't he say that? Didn't he say that? But how many things did Jesus command? And what, if you summarized it, what, he summarized it. He goes, all right, love God with your whole heart. Love everybody else as much as you love yourself. There's the summary. So um, we can get to the list. But really, if you do the hermeneutical work on that, teach them to obey all that I've commanded. Really what he's saying is, Show them how to live in the ways of what is actually already true of God and now true of them because of me. That's really what it's saying. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded. That's a real tweak on that hermeneutic. It really is, okay? It's kind of accurate, but what that's saying is, show them how to walk in my ways. Now you add this, get ready for this, man. You add that to what Jesus said in John 8. If you will be my disciples, if you'll walk in my ways, then you will come to know the truth and that truth will set you free. Now, isn't that crazy? Notice the order there. If you'll be my disciples, if you'll walk in my ways, and this is what Jesus commands us to go do, right? Then you'll come to know the truth and that truth will set you free. But what have we done? And what was I guilty of for so much of life, even as a pastor? We flip that narrative 180 and we go, if you believe what we say is true, say the magic prayer that can't find in scripture, you'll get set free. You won't feel free, but you'll get set free. You know, it's in your afterlife. That's when you catch that check. And then we'll disciple you. Jesus says, if you'll be my disciple, then you'll come to know the truth and that truth will set you free. And we make that like a meta term. So that's when, that's how you get your ticket to heaven punched. But if you there again, just back up a few verses, a couple chapters, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, if you'll walk in my ways in any way, like when it comes to like generosity and who's really your provision and who do you trust for your needs and, and you know, your kids and all that, if you'll walk in my ways, you'll come to know the truth about God and that he owns it all and he loves you and he cares for you and this family is going and that truth will set you free. And so now you'll get to live free. And even if you lose your job or you look at your bank account and go, that's rough, but not much in there, but we need to help these people. God will take care of us. You'll be set free. That's what's going on here. Discipleship is that process of helping each other move from unbelief to belief in every area of life. And if you take Jesus as word in John 8, also, what did he model? The same thing. He didn't say, you got to be a Christian first and I can disciple you. <laughs> Come and follow me, right? Let's walk in my ways. Um, if you take him at face value, then that means people are actually discipled to faith, to truth that sets them free. And then on to maturity. So there's not this flip-flopped, made-up narrative of you got to adhere to a bunch of truths first, say a prayer, and then that sets you free, and then we'll disciple you in your sin management and behavior modificational program. Like we're going to beat it in. We're going to beat it into you. We just we can't going to find it. We'll, and now we'll be very nice about it, though. We'll be very nice, but the assumption will be parallel, just like your parents in school are is that God loves you more when you do this. It's a little less when you don't. And if you really want them to love you, tithe and sign up for a bunch of programs. Okay, because we need people to stack chairs and hand out these flyers. A volunteer show up, work the nursery, do the parking lot, things like that. Super happy now. God's super and, happy. Uh, I heard, really what I heard as you were walking through that, 
was not only are we moving from unbelief to belief, which you talked about the process. And I'm an industrial engineer. I love talking about process. I, I believe that this journey we're on is just that it is a journey where you're not going to get to a destination. It isn't a check the box destination. So we're moving yeah. from unbelief to belief, which is really moving into the truth of what our identity really is. Amen. So Caesar, one of the things we really, we try to dig into this term of redefining success because everything in our culture tries to define success for us. And I believe even those of us that are in church world, we followers of Christ, which most of our listeners are, there may be some that aren't, which we welcome them and love that they're here. But most people, when you start talking about some things about everyday living, about walking this out, about going through the process, I think that there's some people that may struggle with, how do I go from, yeah, I know that I need to do more than what I'm doing Sunday. Or some people may have decided they don't even like going on Sunday. More and they, more, right? But they still feel so. Yeah, we see a lot of numbers like that. If we look at the act, if we read, believe Barna and all. Oh, it's numbers. way past the midpoint. But yeah. I'm so there's a lot of people that aren't going to church, but yet they have some spiritual aspect and somehow that's going to have Jesus. to be addressed. Yeah. So I would love for us in the time we've got here, the last few minutes and all as we head towards trying to do a landing. And I know you've got resources. We're going to ask for some of those at the end. I'm going to let you tell people where to find all the resources because I know so much got stuff, a... folks. <laughs> yeah, but I'd love for you with some time we've got here to speak to the person that's just going, how can I just break away from my rut or where I'm at or just get a little bit deeper? What are some things you can tell people that are wanting to go into that role of an everyday disciple or move down that process closer to belief from where they are in unbelief. Well, I think that the slippery slope of this is, and you just cued it up with the slippery slope, sorry to say, Tim, but is what must I do? And that unfortunately is where we all start because of that do to be distortion. It really is the other way. We have to learn to believe who we be, who we are, our identity, and out of our true identity, which we've already talked a little bit about, is the most natural, fulfilling way to live. Out of that identity, we live into the rhythms of everyday life. And we teach deeply on, there's six rhythms of life that God gave the whole world and everybody from the Garden of Eden up till you and I to people in Ukraine, or we're all living in the same six rhythms. But, but it's not the doing, it's the how, who are we being. And that's where that becoming deeper in our belief about who God has created us to be. See, we, we talk about it as Christians quite often that your identity now is in Christ. If you trust him and, and you're a Christian, it's true, but our identity is also in the father and in the spirit. And it's right back to where it says, right? Matthew 28, go and make disciples. How therefore baptizing them that were baptized means to immerse, to soak them in They're in the name of the father in the name of the son, in the name of the spirit. Wow. All a huge identity statement. So what's discipleship about then? We already talked about it. It's this idea of moving from unbelief to belief, to truth in every area of life connected to what? Our identity. It really is true. Why? Because our identity flows from who God is. He's filling the world with his glory. That's who he is. How's he doing it through us? What's the enemy want to tear down? God's glory, God's image. That's why all the attack on identity and out of all this is where we get gender dysphoria and homosexuality and all the things that we're experiencing right now all flow from a not believing the truth of our identity. We all were believers and not yet believers. We're all created in the identity of a Trinitarian God. And so when people say, what's the first stuff we got to do? Okay, first off, do you believe God's your father? And because if you bear his name, if you're a Bear Kalinowski name in our family, guess what? Yeah, you're family. You know, it's part of that. But we treat everybody like family because that's how we see God doing it. And believe that's what he calls us to do. But if that's true, if dad's, we have the same dad, then Tim, you and I are really family. What's that mean if we were a healthy family? I know a lot of people don't have healthy families, but we always say, what do you think you'd do differently if God was your daddy? Jesus was your brother. That's what he calls us in Hebrews. And you had the power that raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. So no lack of power, motivation, strength, or any of that for this life. 
what do you think life would look like if you believed we were really family? And so are your neighbors, by the way. I think we'd hang out and eat a lot and we'd have fun together and we would share the tough stuff, but not with fear because the do to be thing would be dying because we're living out of identity and that doesn't change based on what you do because of what Christ has already done. And so I think we would live more like a family and share our stuff and care for one another and work together and play and fight and forgive. And you're like, oh, you mean like in the book of Acts? Yeah. And then, okay, but we're also made in the image of the son who is a servant. He came and he says, as I was sent, so I send you. He came as a servant, not to be served, he said, but to, as one who serves. Then if you live as a servant, now you're not wondering, what am I getting out of the deal? You look at everything and go, how might I serve here? Why? Because it'll show people what God's, his glory. So I, I, this, we do whole teachings on this and we could do three episodes on identity if you'd like, but it all starts with believing, really getting soaked in, saturated, baptized in the truth of who God is and who he's created us to be. And now in Christ, it's been restored. And we're, what's faith? What's salvation? It's believing that's true and living out of it. So one thing, Caesar, I'm curious with all that you're doing and with the, we'll call it the mission work that you're doing in the local areas, which is phenomenal. I'm guessing that you are running across quite a few people that have very little, if any, background in, say, traditional formal church may not even have familiarity with the Bible. I grew up in the South, the Bible Belt, and people throw scriptures around because they grew up with scripture. Yeah. I think now we're running across, and we're getting to this. I think Europe's already gotten to this point where there's like a post, post-Christian post where people, you talk about the Bible, they go, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. How Give some examples of how you are just living it out every day. But here's the reason why. I think many people struggle with that. And that is an action. I know I asked about doing early. No, we, out of our identity, we do all kinds of stuff. That's yeah. the doing is not the problem. It's why, what's our motivation for doing it? Sure. And so give some examples that, that you've got of just what happens when this everyday discipleship begins to take root and occur? It starts out usually at our table, okay? And for us, this Food. is your So show, food's involved. Food's involved, meals are involved, time to be is key. It's not a weekly meeting sitting in rows in silence. It's not a group that comes together just to study a book of the Bible and see what parts we agree or disagree with. Because like most of my friends are not believers, not yet believers. Most of my friends are they have some background in it, some Catholicism, a little bit when they were a child, but it never really, that afterlife upgrade gospel never really hit that hard for them. And the sin management behavioral modification wasn't good news. So they're working on it in their own, their ideas and strength. And so for us, usually it starts with a meal. We do lots of parties. We do lots of open tables. That's a big deal. And happy hours. Uh, we, we do happy hour here and people love it. We did happy hours in the driveway during COVID. And we didn't mean to collect a bunch of people. We said, hey, how about, because we, we're already known for doing happy hours. How about we're going to be out in our driveway, you know, Friday at six, and we're going to set up a little table and have a little happy hour. Why don't anybody who wants to do the same thing in a neighborhood and we'll wave at each other. And then maybe in an hour, we'll walk around and talk and wave at each other from the sidewalks. They didn't read the memo. And we just had about 20 something, 30 people show up initially six plus feet apart. By the end of it, nah, not so much. They were dying for community. We put out flyers going, hey, I don't like, we haven't stockpiled a ton of stuff, but we, whatever we got, we're willing to share. And if you can't get out, let us know. We'll, we'll, we can get out. We're healthy by God's grace and anything we can do for you. Here's our name. Here's our phone number. And we just put that all over the neighborhood everywhere and hand it out. Well, people did. And people still talk about that. You guys were the best and you had, you still had your parties and you had us over and it was crazy and we trust you. And so it's, that's how it starts for us. I think that the hugest distinction is that we treat people like family, not like guests. That's a huge one. We don't see people as a guest. Hey, come on in. Can I bring anything? No, just bring your smile on face. Uh, can I help with anything? No, I got it. Just, what can I get you to drink? Just sit down. It's okay. It's all right. No, people come to our house and say, sure, you can bring that. And when they get there, we're like, could you run this out and throw it in the can? I didn't get the garbage out. It's totally overflown. I'm so sorry. Drinks are over here. The glasses are up there. If you don't find something, just root around. It's probably in the fridge. Just like you would with family. 
right away, people respond very different to that. You treat them like a guest, they act like a guest. You treat them like family, they start to act more like family. What that does is that starts to break down. And there's a real intentionality to how we speak with people and the questions we ask. I want to get to know their story. I want to know where they're living in unbelief and lies so I can help them move from that to truth. And that might be through conversation or initially it might be like, I don't believe in family. It's broken. Ours is jacked. I'm on my third marriage. My kids have moved out. They hate me. But I look at your family and I go, it looks like there's an option at least for it to be different. And eventually they want to know why. I can't really explain that without explaining <laughs> our faith and who we believe Jesus is. So it's really simple things like that. Now we teach and train and coach on all this stuff, but it starts out always the same. Hey, let's start having a family dinner night as a family. Then let's start opening up the rings of that relationship a little naturally. Something we're already doing. It's already fun. It's a blast. It's full of joy. Let's just open up the rings to people who are leaning into relationship. Let them experience a little of that. People are dying. Trust me, they're dying for a place at the table. <laughs> We've never had a shortage of people who want to have dinner and hang out with us. It's real simply, real practically like that. I do think that there's some people when we bring up family, my, my wife is one that because of relationship with father and mother and things like that, they may struggle with that. And so I think it's really healthy to show a model yeah. of the way a healthy family functions and operates. I'm curious, one of the things that I've done as I've studied the gospels is I've looked at those four gospels and I've in my mind, I'm trying to think how much time did Jesus actually spend with the 12? I've and done the math. The, Have you? I've tried to. So I'm going to ask it. Let me mention one other thing and then I'll let you respond to that. Because I, I keep hearing, and maybe this is the question and you could expand on this. I keep hearing you say there's patience, there's time. It's not like it's a real quick text and that's your relationship with someone. We spend 35 minutes sitting beside you and we greet at the beginning of the service and then we're out, we're done. Don't even go to lunch together. There, there is time with discipleship and, and interacting with people, which also means I don't think that you can really do it well with more than a certain number. Maybe the number is 12. I don't know. But tell me, yeah, what is the math? He had three years, but they hung out together. So it, all it's a guess, the time. right? I did the math, and I'll just tell you what my math was. It was about three and a half years. Okay, by the time Jesus went back to dad, hung out with dad, and they were pretty much there. They were together if they were awake. So let's just give it 18 hours. It's about 30,000 hours Jesus hung out with his disciples. Now, I did the other side of the math, and I won't remember the exact number, but pretty close, I think. If let's just say the people in our church, they all come every week, okay, two hours, and they never miss, okay? And they come midweek, hour and a half. And because we're a disciple in church, we are rock stars. One Saturday a month for two hours, we equip like crazy. And everybody makes it. I added that up and I said, to get to 30,000 hours, how long would it take? And it was something like 120 something years, I think, to equal the same parity. Now, let me go back to something I said earlier. Jesus did the 30,000 hours with people, complete open life. You've heard it said, but I say, this is what the father is doing. You know what he's like? He's like a couple hundred gallons of wine, three days into a party. That's dad's heart, just so you know, our first miracle, stuff like that. But the 11 were still there with him watching at his ascension, and some still weren't sure about it. They weren't quite not believing. Hold, hand in the holes, I don't know, resurrected, miracles, I'm still not sure. If that's Jesus' track record and his disciples changed the world, and you and I are still talking about it today, then I think we can give ourselves a break here and say, discipleship is not microwave. It's not super duper fast. You're going to have to invest deeply. We just say discipleship is very, if you want to get a quick picture of it, it's very much like re-parenting the culture. How long does it take to raise kids? 20, 30 years? Our kids are in their 30s now. We're very much still actively parenting. It looks very different. It looks very different. It's very active though. It's very, and by then they want that. Like it's, right? But by the time they moved out, 20s or something, that's a 20 year investment, man. 
that's still way short of 30 hours an hour <laughs> because I wasn't with my kids 18 hours a day. I was at work and they're at school and sports and <laughs> yeah. So, so the thing I love about that is, is the thing that we miss in our culture, which is patience and time. And it's one of the reasons why I love you brought up earlier that you coach, and I'm about to ask you here for some of the resources and things that you have available. I'm a coach. I'm an executive coach. And I've said this before, sounds a little bit self-serving. I think some of the closest things to discipleship in our modern day culture is the relationship that coaches have, because I spend a lot of time with people I work with. Coach, you spend a lot of time. Yeah. Maybe let's don't look at us. Let's look at maybe a high school athletic coach spending a lot of time. So I, I think the thing we're missing is we're being robbed of patience and time. And that is one of the factors that we've got to have. We've got to have that heart to spend time and be patient with it and allow this process to, for people to go from unbelief to belief. Tell us now, and I'll let you share whichever one that you think is appropriate or a lot of them or whatever. I know you've got podcasts and I've got a link here that's got all kinds of resources. Tell us about some of the resources that you have and maybe some of the first ones that people need to go check out when they're listening in on a conversation like we've just had. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share this stuff. We're passionate about this. This is what my wife and I do all day. This is our life with people and then also coaching and equipping others to experience the greater spiritual freedom because they're not having to try to like please God because he's already pleased in Christ. And then relational peace to live open with people, with their kids, with each other, with neighbors and live free. I would say the first thing is please come and check out the podcast. We've done it six and a half years like you, hundreds of episodes and every imaginable topic addressed from this perspective. What would it look like if the gospel spoke into that part of our life and we could learn to get fluent about that, but not like weirdos, you know what I mean? Not chapter and verse of people, but like how does the gospel speak to marriage or our parenting or what's going on with identity out there in the world right now, or hundreds and hundreds of things. And it's called the Everyday Disciple podcast, you know, for a reason, right? And I would love folks to just come and check that out. And you skip around. You don't have to listen to the latest episode. If you don't want, there's hundreds, dig around, let the titles and curiosity drive you in that. But I, and you can find that and a ton of resources like training, equipping hundreds of videos, just go to everydaydisciple.com. So everydaydisciple.com, you'll find the podcast there. Now it's also everywhere podcasts are just like yours and Spotify, it's Apple, it's everywhere, right? But if you want to like at least initially find it, see what it looks like and get and download a bunch of free stuff. Like we, we have like how to have an awesome family dinner, <laughs> how to have killer date night with your wife, how to date your kids. What are these six rhythms of life that we already live in? What if we started to live out of our identity into those? Because we're already doing it. And so is everybody we know. It sounds like no additional time needed, just some intention. Great. Tons of teaching on that. There's all kinds of resources. And I've got books, of course, if they, you want to check out some books, there'll be links for that stuff as well. Yeah, we'll include links down there. And I do agree that the conversation we've had here, someone listening in really needs to go to the Everyday Disciple podcast. It should be easy within your player. You might be watching this on YouTube and can check things out, but just, I would check it out because I definitely think there's a good mesh between what we're talking about here and what you're doing there. Caesar, we are seek, go, create those three words. I'm going to let you choose one of those over the other two just for kicks and see what resonates more with you right now. Which word do you choose and why? Well, I've thought about this a little bit. I saw the name of your show and I knew you were going to ask this question. You listen, this is part of being a Caesar. I can't follow the rules. It's two, it's go and it's create. I, I just, I'm creative. I've been a creator my whole life. I was a musician and a record producer, songwriter forever and ever. And now I write and make videos and all. But I guess if I only could pick one, I would be the go. I really would be the go and make, go and be. It's not, our faith is not a come and see. That was the old covenant. Come and see, come to the temple, do all your business, get back to it. We've been given now a go and make, go and be, go be disciples who make disciples and help people find this spiritual freedom that Jesus died to give us, not an afterlife upgrade gospel. And then try to sin less. Come on, man, sin less and tithe once in a while. So 
Yeah, I think it would be go, like get out there, give your life away. And part of going is just opening up your life, it really is. It open up time, like you were saying. We don't give time to this. People don't give time to parenting either. And that's part of what we're seeing, what we're seeing in family life and identity issues and all that. So I think I'd go with go for that reason. <laughs> that does not surprise me with your personality and all. I really love that. Caesar. thank you for joining us here. It's been such a great conversation. I appreciate our buddy, Eric Nevins, for introducing us and connecting us. It really, yeah, thanks, Eric. It, it really is a beautiful thing here. If you've been listening in, I'm going to ask a big favor. And that is going back to what we said earlier, share this episode with someone who you believe might need to hear that they need to move for this process from unbelief to belief or move towards being an everyday disciple. And I know you know someone, so take a screenshot or share this episode with them, introduce them to the Everyday Disciple podcast. Just share this. That is the number one way that people get exposed to podcasts like this is when yeah. someone personally shares this with them. Thanks for joining us. We have new episodes every Monday. Until next time, continue being all that you were created to be.